You're listening to Lighthouse Conversations, brought to you by Lighthouse Haven, a spiritual home for your awakening soul. Lighthouse Conversations is a show where awakening souls gather to be inspired, connected, and enlightened. Spiritual spark plug and host, Chelly Canales, that's me, will guide you through the twists and turns of your journey to a safe haven where you are finally free to live your best light. Each episode contains a conversation with a guest who has gone through a spiritual awakening, detailing their unique and life-changing experiences in an intimate and candid way. Although everyone's experience is as unique as they are, we all share one common thread. We're all seeking something. So come join us on this journey and be prepared to leave with resources that will supercharge you into inspired action. Here's today's episode. Well, hey there, Awakening Souls. How's everything going? Things are good here. I am reading a ton of books and I am learning from these incredible authors who each have decided to step into their own best light. They found the way that they're best able to serve the world by doing the thing that resonates with them, that they love most, that their own personal individual journeys took them on. And this week is really special. Diana Rowan, the author of The Bright Way, is my guest. And her book came at such a perfect time for me because this is when I'm launching my own program. Um, it's a creative a program for creatives and people who are on stage, whether it's as an artist or as a speaker. And the whole idea is, is allowing spirit to work through that and how to eliminate blocks of things that don't need to be there, things that keep us away from our greatest expression. Well, Diana's book is her own version of how to help you connect to your own creativity. And The Bright Way is a system she's been teaching for years, and now she has um, all of this information together for you as a book. She is such a soothing, beautiful presence. She she plays the harp, and to me, like her voice sounds like the harp. She's just lovely. I think you will be very soothed by this conversation. You will learn something. She brings not only her own personal knowledge of of being an artist and having those struggles, but she brings in things like Greek mythology and alchemy and the elements, and it's just such a complete beautiful, inspiring piece. And I'm so thrilled to share it with you. So everyone enjoy the episode. And welcome to the show, Diana. How are you? Thanks. I'm doing great. I am thrilled to meet you, of course, for this phone call for the first time, but I feel like I know you well already from reading your (laughs) book, The Bright Way, Five Steps to Freeing the Creative Within. Now, I am so um, involved right now in in learning about the creative process myself and all of the various blocks and things that I've encountered in my life. You just so beautifully laid everything out in a way that makes things accessible for people who are going through their own creative journeys. And what is so unique about your book is that you bring in everything from your personal experience to like Greek mythology, you have all this classical (laughs) information that really informs all these modern things that we're going through. What I want to talk to you about is your process towards getting to the book and how you started out as a child with talent, but with crippling performance anxiety to getting through this spiritual journey to where you are today. Lovely. I'm looking forward to it. So I was, as soon as I started music, when I was eight years old, I knew I wanted to be a professional musician. And I felt when I played music that I was in touch with the greatest reality. I actually felt more alive. I felt more real. I felt like I was privy to this amazing world that we all have access to and that it's all there at all times. But then as time went on and I looked at the reality of being a professional musician, I began to get terrible anxiety. I began to feel really fearful about the results of anything I did. And I think I became terrified of judgment. Of course, I did not know that at the time. I just felt really, really afraid. I had no words at that point to describe what I was going through. And actually, I barely used any words at all because I tried to hide that experience from most people. I felt like it was a bad sign that I had anxiety. I felt like, and anxiety is putting it mildly, I mean, I was over the top, throwing up, crying, all kinds of things, you know, but I wouldn't talk about it to anybody because I felt like it was a sign that I wasn't talented. And I had a very, very 
big notion that talent is a gift that is somehow just given to you, and some people have more than others. Now, this is something, of course, I'm completely against. In my experience, this is absolutely not true, but I didn't discover that until far later. So I went through this really lonely and torturous journey for a long time until finally when I was in college for music, I actually threw in the towel. I just gave up. I was like, you know what? I'm going to an early grave at this point. I cannot live like this anymore. I was so miserable that I was willing to give up music. And instead, I went into doing a lot of social work. I worked in battered women's shelters, in homeless shelters, in drug halfway houses, uh, uh, Berkeley Free Clinic, because, you know, I have a great passion for healing. Uh, that we all can heal ourselves and that we want to have access to the information that will help us heal ourselves. So as I was working through these various environments, I noticed that everybody really wanted to feel connected to themselves again. They wanted to regain their power. And I noticed that I was trying to help people regain their power. And at the same time, I'd totally given up mine. I had given up my entire creative process. You know, what my life had been about for most of my life. And the irony of that wasn't lost to me. <laughs> and uh, literally, while I was in these environments, I would also show people things on the piano on the side and I would see how it would really empower them and that they would feel this type of confidence that some of them had said to me nothing else makes me feel this way nothing else makes me feel this alive even the drugs that I'm on and I'm like wow this is powerful stuff and I began to remember what music really is and that it is a way of really connecting deeply to yourself again and deep, deeply connecting to the big reality that we're all part of and that we all hold hands together through. So they began showing me the power of music and reminding me again what creativity is on a grand scale. So even though I'm saying music, what I really mean is whenever you're directly engaged with something again in your life, it could be cooking, it could be gardening, it could be painting, it could be raising your children. When you reconnect to these things, you remember who you are and you remember what your purpose is. And looking back at my very young self, I realized what I lost touch with was my purpose and I don't think purpose is too big a word to use even for a small child because we're born with our purpose. It's already there the moment we're born. Mm -hmm. mm. And, and so it's not a tall order to say, hey, go back and remember your purpose. And it was there from day one. So the very shortened version, and I know we'll talk more about it, but the very shortened version was that my journey was one of remembering my purpose. Remembering is such an important word because there's a process that happens, I think, as we get older where layers of judgment get um, piled on us, layers of us being too worried about what other people think. Is it not good enough for others? And it takes time to, like you said, get back to yourself and remember who you are and why you're here. What's that thing that lights you up? The thing that connects you with your source and with everyone around you. It's an essential, beautiful thing. And it almost feels like, at least to me, felt like death when I was disconnected from mine. Um, I, I want to hear more about that that moment in your life when you said, this is enough. I can't handle this anymore. You, you've you created a way to help other people through their um, journey through it. How did you find it for yourself? Well, when I did give up, it was, it felt, it felt like I had to give up. I felt like I could not live like this anymore because the misery was so deep. And at that moment, it felt like a total giving up on many things. And I felt very... Um, sad and ashamed of it. And I also felt like 
for the high level of anxiety that I had, it was a relief to give it up. So even though I felt so sad and um, like a failure completely, um, I still wanted to give it up. I, it really was no way to be living, to be living in that degree of fear. What I've learned since then is that fear has nothing to do with creativity. That's just all about judgment and, you know, being beholden to external feedback, not knowing what you're about. But I had blamed music instead. Mm. I was like, no, it's music that's at fault and I need to get rid of that. Wow. That wasn't what I needed to let go of, actually, <laughs> you know. Um, but as I said, you know, seeing all these people being empowered by music, I thought, well, there's a way that I can bring it back into my life mm -hmm. where there isn't so much judgment. I can actually just play for myself as I see them doing. Why not try that? So I rented a piano and I started playing again and I really loved it. And my roommates at the time, because I was in my very early 20s at that point, they they were like, we didn't know you played piano. And <laughs> well, Will you show us, you know, how to play this for Elise? Will you show us how to play the theme from the piano? Will you show us? And so I began showing them various things about the piano. And I actually had a great time doing it. I really enjoyed teaching. And so I thought, well, you know, I could teach, and I'm going to teach in a really different way. I'm going to teach in a way that doesn't involve judgment. It's going to be us discovering music together. And I'm going to be encouraging people as I did in the environments that I was just speaking about. So very informal and totally focused on the person who's playing and their experience, that it's all about that experience. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. You really touched on something that I feel like I've discovered for myself over the past few years as well. And that I teach, which is if you focus on the service, it's less about me looking at myself and saying, how am I doing? Am I okay? Are you getting what you want? And it's more like, how can I serve the piece? How can I serve the audience? And, um, it, it really sounds like through your care for your, your friends, through your care for the community that you were serving, you were able to rekindle that fire in yourself and it came flowing back. It's almost like it felt safe to flow back to you because it wasn't feeling in a space of judgment. Um, I'm so, I'm just, just so touched by your journey. I just feel it so deeply. And I know there's a lot of people out there who will get it very deeply as well. I want to hear about how you came up with creative alchemist. Alchemy is one of my favorite words. And I think it's just so fantastic to apply it um, in many ways. Tell me how you use it through this work. So as I went through this journey, I ultimately came to believe that when we have creative blocks and creative anxieties, it is, at the end of the day, a spiritual crisis. We can address it practically, you know, with preparing better, with learning better. Um, we can address it psychologically, You're looking at issues from the past, um, issues around judgment. Then you reach a point where you have to look at the spiritual. For me, we have to bring spirituality back into the conversation when it comes to creativity. Absolutely. And people get really anxious about that because they suddenly feel like you're talking about religion, mm -hmm. which I'm not, I'm not talking about mm -hmm. that at all. <laughs> you know, I'm not talking about organized religion. I'm, I'm talking about a spirituality where there's a mystery and a connection that cannot be described either in psychological or practical scientific terms. It does go beyond those things. It's not contradicting those things, but it's still another element that must be looked at. And I've gone down many spiritual paths. You know, ever since I was a tiny child, I've been interested in spirituality. My mother's an astrologer. Uh, I grew up in Ireland and then in other countries like Cyprus. Uh, I've lived in Bulgaria. There's a lot of different spiritual paths that I, sound, I find so fascinating, and I take something from everything in them. When I discovered alchemy, so... The principles of alchemy, there are seven of those, and there are seven operations, and they're very much based in a very ancient philosophy that comes originally out of Egypt, out of ancient Egypt, and has gone throughout the world. So you'll find Chinese alchemy, Middle Eastern alchemy, uh, European alchemy, all sorts. Um, what I love about alchemy is 
you don't have to come from any particular time or culture or even religion. You can literally be an atheist and follow alchemy. So alchemy is one of those uniquely powerful frameworks that you can use to tap into, regardless of, of where you stand on almost any single issue, and it will still work. So for me, it was a way to tap into spirituality in a way that is uniquely accessible. So when I began getting into alchemy, I was so, so excited and all the connections started blossoming. So although alchemy may sound like, oh, it's transforming lead into gold, isn't You're it? Right. Like kind of these like experiments or whatever. That's actually a metaphor. It's really about transforming our more base instincts, our more sort of lower ways of being into our higher ways of being, transforming them into gold. So it's really a process of self-realization. And it provides a wonderful framework in that it works on two levels. And I've used both these levels in the book. So uh, the one level is sequential. So the operations of alchemy, there's seven of those, they follow step by step. You, you start with calcination, which sounds very scary, <laughs> but it's really, it's the burning away of anything extraneous right. so that we can get down to the work. And then it follows through with predictable steps, um, all seven of them. And those have been a great comfort to my students because, you know, we can, ex we can anticipate what's coming next. And this can be especially marvelous when we hit uh, fermentation. So one of the steps are that, you know, we, we reach this um, around step four of our process. Uh, we find ourselves feeling really great and that we've got a whole new realization on life. We've, we think, Eureka, I found it. Everything's <laughs> great. Everything's so powerful. But in alchemy, they say fermentation is right around the corner, and that means you're going to have a dark night of the soul soon. Yeah, that's and right. And hasn't that happened to all of us? Yes. We think we've figured it out, <laughs> and suddenly it's like, oh, my God, a whole new vista opens up, and we're like, oh, I didn't know anything. I didn't realize all of this. And it can be so traumatizing. But when you follow alchemy, you're like, yeah, I know it's coming, so I'm going to enjoy this Keep plateau going. as mm -hmm. fast as I can. And then when I hit that... I know I'm going to hit it and it's going to be fine. I'm going to work through it. It's actually bringing me to the next level. Mm. Yes, you're creating expectations so that you can better go through the um, process of it, knowing that it's going to be there. Yeah. It doesn't make it less difficult, but you also know that it's not forever. This is part of the process. Yeah, and this really builds resilience, which is mm. one of the main things that I try to teach because when we are being creative, you know we're being open, we're being vulnerable, and it would be remiss of me to not also teach how to be resilient because, you know, hey, we're in this amazing university that is the mm, world, and we right. get many, many lessons coming our way on a regular basis, and so we want to be able to handle those. We want to be prepared to deal with them. And so alchemy is an amazing way to prepare for whatever comes at you. It, it stokes your inspiration and it also builds your resilience. Oh, I see that so clearly. And thank you for articulating that so beautifully. I also love how in the book you use the elements to uh, work through the process of, of, of the bright way. Um, and, and you replace, is it ether that you replace the word ether with spirit? Um, yes. I love that spirit is involved in this. To, to, to me, that's the missing piece in everything. It is the key to channeling, to being connected, to giving a performance that is different than, oh, you know, they really know their notes. They sure practiced a lot to like, I'm weeping and I don't know why. Um, that, that beautiful connection that happens. Talk to me a little bit about how you were inspired to use those elements in the process of writing this book. One of the spiritual paths that I went down, and, and in many ways I'm still involved, is earth-based spirituality. So sometimes it's called Wicca, sometimes it's called mm -hmm. you know traditional Celtic styles of thinking. Um, and in every culture, there's a, a great sort of pagan element. And For in sure. the Greek philosophers, you know, they were talking about the elements as having qualities onto themselves that needed to be cultivated at all times. So 
again, going to the elements, which are earth, air, fire, water, and spirit, I like to use, uh, these are non-controversial things. Just like alchemy can be used by anybody, regardless of your beliefs, we can admit that fire exists, that water <laughs> exists, you know? And in a time when people are quite polarized, it's a great thing to have items that we can agree upon and we yes. can meet on together and we can build together. And so I really wanted to include nature mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in in the book uh, because, of course, she's been a great part of my spiritual path. And when we're talking about creativity, nature is pretty much, to me, the ultimate template for creativity. So how can we tap into nature and use her as a model for our creativity? Well, one way is by the elements and That's by right. you looking at fire. You know, what was fire originally? Well, it was the original, you know, Big Bang, and it's all yeah. the original inspiration. And so I correlate fire with inspiration. And when we think about inspiration, it can feel like uh, quite a uh, remote term or heady term. But when we say well, it's really fire, then you get right down there, you know, into mm. this, yeah, into those passionate realms and we get into the poetic realms we get into the sense of drive the sense of a of a consuming fire that is a positive fire a life-affirming fire um you know immediately when i found when i use the elements all these personal associations come up for people that make what may seem like remote creative terms uh like technique, for example, mm -hmm. they make they make them sound much more real and poetic and emotional. So, for instance, I correlate technique with earth, and the you know, earth is a practical, tangible thing. And say you're a writer, and you're like technique. Oh, what does that mean? Well, what are the earthy means that you're using? You know, what is the type of grammar you're using let's get even more earthy where are you writing do you have a, an actual physical space for your writing right. what state are you in when you're writing you know are you trying to write at the very end of the day when your state when your physical body is depleted depleted yeah you know so uh in numerous ways i we love weaving the elements in uh, both from the spiritual perspective and also from the nature template. You know, I love that you brought in the earth element because I feel like each person has their own strengths and I'm not going to say weaknesses, but a little bit less strong in, and I'm a clouds person for sure. Vision, ideas, creative spark. And when it comes to bringing it to life, I will find every excuse to not actually produce it. <laughs> and granted, <laughs> I'm getting better at obviously I have to put things out in the world in order to share them because ideas don't mean anything if they're not put out there to serve somebody is, is what I, is my belief. So you have some practical tips in every chapter in terms of using those things like for earth, for example, in terms of giving birth to the ideas, actually bringing them to the ground and making them a tangible thing. What advice would you give for that? Well, I mean, I have to say you are putting your work out so beautifully in the world right now. Thank I mean, you. you are already doing it. So um, one thing is to notice what you're already doing and celebrate that thing. You're right. And, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's never enough. <laughs> it's that right. perfection trap that you, you know, talk well, about as well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And we all fall privy to that. And, you know, I mean, there's even a positive side to that in the sense that there's a drive that we have to get better and better. But letting go of perfection is key because, you know, there is no such thing. Um, but, you know, regarding uh, tips on the earth chapter. So that's in uh, step three, which is create your practicum plan. And I'm One, asking very purely selfishly for, you know, for selfish reasons right now. <laughs> I love Give it. Me advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, literally looking at your state, I think is a very important thing. And I, so in the book, I love to use these uh, drawings that my amazing designer Vlad made and, uh, he created a triangle and it says state in the middle and there are three prongs that uphold your state that you're in. And one is sleep, one is sustenance, and the other 
is I'm forgetting now. I can't even believe it. Movement. Yeah, movement, which I need more of right now to tell you the truth. I mean, I've been down on my... So let me describe what those are. Yes, yes. So telling that I forgot movement. Um, (laughs) So as creatives, we can really overlook our state. And, uh, you know, I'm guilty of that for sure. So uh, we don't cultivate our physical body. Mm -hmm. kind of drive it to the limit. Um, And of those three things, sleep, movement, and sustenance, I'm really good on sleep. I am an absolute maniac when it comes to getting (laughs) eight hours. I'm really good at that because I can, yeah, I can tell the very next day if I haven't had enough sleep, I tell you my IQ is half. Mm. I can Mm -hmm. see the bad results immediately. So I'm, I'm really good at that. I'm also good about my eating because my body also gives me a lot of feedback regarding what suits my body and what doesn't. So I give tips about how to recognize, you know, what's good for your body and what isn't because everybody is unique. Absolutely. And it does we, keep you uh, from being a clear channel, you know, by, by your body having to fight to do natural things like digestion and, and mental capacity. So that doesn't leave a lot of space for creativity or a lot of fuel for that. Right. Right. And so I've seen that, you know, sometimes people who have trouble memorizing something, for example, they just say, Oh, I have a bad, bad memory. And I'm like, I don't know about that. You know, could you, uh, could you tell me, you know, when are you writing or practicing? And they're like, well, you know, yeah, I'm doing it at the end of the day, or I'm trying to do it right before dinner. I'm like, are you hungry? Mm-hmm. Or are you tired? And, you know, amazing turnarounds happen when people, Instead, find out when their best energy times are and work during those times. And part of that is fueling yourself in the first place. Um, But regarding movement, you know, in the past four months, when I was really, or five months even, really doing the final edits on my book, I was all in on that. And I fell off the wagon when it comes to my yoga practice and my dance. So I do tango uh, Argentinian tango as a Love hobby. It. Yeah, it's so fun. And I uh, I can feel the effects of not having that movement, I have to say. So those would be um, three things that right away people can take action on. Ch- making sure to get enough sleep. And if you can't in the night, try to take a nap. Um, the uh, And I give some tips around that, you know, limiting screen time and all those things that we do. Uh, then regarding sustenance, you know, are you fueling your body? And then the, the third thing with movement is it certainly doesn't have to be going to the gym. Mm-hmm. It can literally be walking around your block. It right. can be, you know, doing some stretches in your house. It doesn't have to look dramatic. But just as long as you do some movement, uh, you would be amazed at the creative and spiritual benefits, you know, from (laughs) some of the best ideas drop in during workouts for sure. I'm like, Oh, I've got to write that down. And it's, Mm -hmm. it's incredible because if you take, for me, at least if you take your mind off of the thing you're trying to solve or create and you focus on something else, you get in body, then it gives your mind that space without your input, without you nagging and looking over it. Like, are you done? Did you get it? Did you get it yet? It gives you the um, the space to come up with that solution or title of the book or, you know, poem that you wanted to write. And yeah, it, it works like a charm. It really does. I totally, totally relate. Oh my goodness. I need to get back to the mat. <laughs> <laughs> and it's okay. You know, we, we fall off the wagon and then yes. we get right back on, you know, it's just... <laughs> It's a cycle. Yeah. It's about balance. It's about, I think, also not being too hard on yourself. Yeah. When you when yeah. you don't make it there, that's okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, these are wonderful, great tips, by the way. And there's your book is full of them. So I, I just highly recommend that people pick it up. I want to know how, in your process of teaching this, you decided this is going to be a book. Did somebody approach you? Was it just a ping in your heart that said, this needs to be shared at, at a greater um, capacity than it is just immediately with your students. How did that come about? So I have an online membership program where I mm-hmm. teach this method. Mm-hmm. And so there are members from all over the world, oh, yes. you know, out in Tasmania to mm-hmm. Israel to you know Europe, all over North America, Mexico. And we're all learning that method together. 
because you know they they're teaching me i mean it's all quite a mystery school in many ways yes you know there's a lot of cross fertilization going and it turns out that one of my members is a dedicated amateur harpist so she plays the harp for her own pleasure and and sharing it with others uh and a career publisher Mm. And so she wrote to me and said, um, I think this is a book. Do you want to talk about it? And I was like, yeah, sure. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> you know, oh, you know, um, we met up and uh, we started work on the process of a proposal. Mm-hmm. And that's when I realized how much work it is, which was fabulous. I feel like I went through a whole other creative rebirth going through this book journey. Uh, Because, you know, I have performed a lot, I've taught a lot, I have, you know, written a lot, um, but I'd never written a book. And so I was a beginner. I started again. So as I was writing the book, I was working all those steps at the same time on myself. So how it started was actually from one of my members. I mean, it couldn't have come from a better place. Mm. You know, it was so organic. And then as we developed the proposal and she brought it to New World Library, which turned out to be the perfect publisher for me, I just felt like lightning had struck me. I mean, I was like, Mm -hmm. but in a really good way. Yes, yes. I I am uh, so lucky for this to happen. I mean, this got given to me and that is why I went all in. I was like, this is, you know, It's partly why I fell off the yoga mat. (laughs) You know, I was like, I've got to be all in on this. And so that's how it happened, was this very organic way, but looking at it clearly, it's that I've been talking about this for a long time and sharing it for a long time. So, you know, whatever you're doing in life, tell people about it. You know, people won't know what you're doing and what you have to offer unless you actually tell them about it. Mm-hmm. So if, mm-hmm. if I hadn't been doing this program, she would never have heard. And by the way, I actually met her at a American Harp Society potluck. And I was like, oh, That's God, do, do I have time to go to the potluck? I have a thousand other things to do today. Oh, I'll just go and I'll show up. And I met her right there. And if I hadn't gone to that, yeah, so that's another thing is that community, which is one of the essential elements, and it's actually connected to spirit. So spirit and community are the same to me. Um, You've, besides sharing things with people, you have to go out and meet people. You know, it's really, really important. They provide such, you know, inspiration, such feedback, such opportunity, This is where magic happens. You know, you mm -hmm. can like think about it all day long. You can have this wonderful process, but what does it mean if you can't have community with someone, not only to say if they, if that work might be for them or it might not, but they might say something that will spark something else in you. And those connections, those relationships will continue to feed you through the creative process because it's just so necessary to living in this, in this world, being on this plane, you know, we live so that we can, support one another, be reflected in each other. And um, that's how things are created. So yeah, community is so important. Your book is just full of so much knowledge. There's so many little gifts. It's a treasure. I want to know if there's one thing you would want to leave people with about this book from your mouth directly, what would it be? It would be that you are creative. You are already creative. You were born creative. You don't have to look for your creativity. It's already inside you. You may, as we all do, look for inspiration regarding your creativity. You may, you know, get a book about it or listen to podcasts about it, talk to other people about it, but know that it's already inside you. You can't lose your creativity, even if you feel like you've gone on off track for decades you can still come back because you can't lose it. And the reason that the creativity that's already inside you is so important is that it makes you feel directly connected again to yourself, to source, and to everything around you, your world, your community. And 
at the end of the day, we want to feel connected. I think our greatest fear is disconnection. When I look at all big fears, ultimately they point to a disconnection of some time, some kind. So reestablishing connection is super important and creativity is already inside you. And it's a great way to reestablish connection to everything. So that would be my biggest message with the book. Those are words to live by for sure. And I'm sure it's actually a bomb to the soul of many people listening to it because it can feel very painful when you think it doesn't exist for me or it left me um, and it's not coming back. It's there. It's always there. It's absolutely there. I mean, one of my, my favorite stories is a beloved harp student. She started when she was 83 years old. Oh. And she had always wanted to play the harp and finally was giving herself this gift. And she felt like there's no way I can take it up at this late age. Plus, she had extreme performance anxiety. She had been a pianist earlier in her life. Within a year and a half, she was out performing her harp. She would put that harp in her car, drive it. <laughs> to hospitals around the Bay Area, take it out in the lobby and play for people. That makes my heart sing. That's so yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Oh. Wow. <laughs> wow. And just like allowing herself, like you said, that gift, that just changes the trajectory of her life and the people who are touched by the music that oh, she creates. Yeah. Yeah. So Diana, how can people work with you? Um, the listeners at home, how can they get in touch with your work? The best way is through my website, which is my name, dianarowan.com. And just getting in touch there is is the best way. I do have a uh, what's called Bright Knowledge Harp Circle, where we uh, walk through the steps. And I'm uh, the, the whole book teaches. Uh, and also, I'm in the process of developing options for the wider creative audience. Uh, so... Bright Knowledge Harp Circle actually has quite a few people in it who aren't harpists who are still using <laughs> the system. But I know the name could be sort of like, what? Uh, so I'm working on developing a program that anyone who wants to feel more creative could join as well. So just getting in touch with me and um, joining my lists would be amazing. And I'm always wanting to hear about people's creative journeys. So it would be a delight to hear. Well, anybody. thank you for being such yeah. a gift to creativity and the world and people <laughs> who want to get back in touch with their creativity. The book is The Bright Way, Five Steps to Freeing the Creative Within. Diana Rowan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure. <laughs> thank you for listening to Lighthouse Conversations. If this show resonates with you, it would mean so much to have you rate, review, and share. Don't forget to follow us at ChelliCanales.com and on social media.